All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. We are continuing measurement, data display, and interpretation with direct, indirect, and product measures of behavior. These are our three umbrellas under which data collection fall. So we're going to go over each one of them, give a couple of examples, and then some advantages and disadvantages. Not an overly complex topic. It's a overview of measurement that we're going to dive deeper into afterwards, but it's important to understand where each of our measurements fall and then why we would use one of these over the other or why you might want to avoid one of these measures. As always, please subscribe to get all of our video updates on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. So let's start with what measurement is. Measurement is the size, length, or amount of something. In ABA terms, we're looking at the magnitude, the duration maybe, the latency, or the amount, maybe the frequency. You have to keep things simple, right? All, when we're, we're talking measurement, when we get really in the weeds, we can make it too complex. We're just looking at the amount of something or how long something lasts or the, the magnitude of something. It's really that straightforward. And why is it important? Why do we measure? Well, one, evaluate the effectiveness of our interventions. Why do we collect baseline? So we have something to compare it to when we do start intervention. Measurement is the heart of what we do. Without measurement, there is no behavior analysis. There's nothing to analyze. You've got to measure, and you've got to measure accurately, reliably, and consistently. Now, we want to make data-driven decisions, right? So we need data. We can track progress over time. We can create graphs, which are easy for us to read and easy for the parents or teachers or stakeholders to read. And we can start to identify functional relationships between behavior. With the data we collect, we can form graphs. We can look at baseline versus interventions versus generalization. We can compare client to client, situation to situation. Measurement provides all of that beautiful data that allows us to do what we do. Now, we use various methods to quantify behavior because that's essentially what we're doing, right? Behavior is this abstract thing that we're describing in words. When we count it, for instance, we're just putting a number on the behavior. So we're looking at direct, indirect, and product measurement. Each type has advantages, disadvantages, and applications. Let's start with direct measurement. Direct measurement is the best measurement. And as always, things are not cut and dry. So sometimes direct measurement might not be best for one reason or another. In general, however, direct measurement is considered the most accurate because it happens in real time as the behavior happens. We are observing and recording the behavior as it happens. And you see, I repeat that multiple times. Behavior as it happens, as it happens, as the behavior happens. It's the key characteristic of direct measurement. If you are directly observing the behavior as it happens, that is a direct real-time measurement. Now, continuous or discontinuous falls under that direct measurement umbrella. And so those examples could include frequency, duration, rate, Latency, into response time, interval recording, time sampling. All of these involve what? It involves the direct observation of the behavior. We can't go back in time and watch it. We can't just ask for a report. If you're asking your technician about frequency they collected, you did not directly measure that behavior. The technician did. It's a very important distinction. Who's ever directly or who's ever observing the behavior as it happens is the one conducting that direct measurement. Some advantages, high accuracy. You are going to get the best accuracy when you are actually watching the behavior in real time. It gives you real time data so we can see as it occurs what's going on. And we get real contextual information. We can see those antecedents. We can see those consequences. We can form those good ABC connections. If we're using indirect measurement, which we're about to talk about, we don't get to see with our own eyes what happens before and after, right? 
with direct measurement, we get all of those extra details. Now, why can it be a problem? Well, you need an observer present, right? So when we're not at session, you're, you're not directly observing anything. That's challenging, right? It can be really resource intensive. It takes more time. It takes more effort and reactivity. Think about when you observe a, a technician, for example, they're going to react to your presence. When you observe a client, they're going to react to your presence. So when you're observing behavior directly, that behavior is just going to change just by virtue of you being there. Moving on to indirect measurement. Indirect measurement involves gathering information based on recollection, interviews, or rating scales. So if, we're, if we view direct measurement as behavior as it happens, indirect measurement is the opposite. We're not actually observing the behavior. We're looking at all the other sources other than direct observation. That could be interviewing a teacher. That could be providing a checklist to close family members. That can be giving a rating scale to the client. That can be giving a questionnaire to the siblings. We're getting all this secondhand information, but we're not actually observing the information. And it should be obvious, but it's going to be less reliable, less accurate, less objective compared to direct measurement. Think about how a parent talks about their kid versus how everyone else might talk about their kid, right? Their input, their opinions, extremely valuable. It's going to be biased. Just, just is, right? A teacher, maybe they don't like the kid. That's going to be biased, right? How you talk about the client, how the technician talks about the client, how y'all report things versus how other stakeholders report things. It's all going to be different. So these recollections, these interviews have value, but they're just not going to be as accurate as that direct measurement. What are some advantages though? Easy to implement, quick conversation, quick rating scale, easy to perform. Less resource intensive, less time intensive. You can gather information on behaviors that are private to so think those private events or occur infrequently. Maybe you're told over and over again about a behavior that occurs You've never seen it, but you want to gather information anyway. Well, this might be the way. Okay. Now, disadvantages, not objective. Okay. It's everyone's going to, it's going to be everybody's opinion prone to bias, especially from direct caregivers and stakeholders may not accurately reflect actual behavior. The, what we think happened our memories aren't always and are often not accurate and we get limited context. So we're just really getting a, a, anecdotal story of what occurred. We're missing critical details, critical information. It might not even be accurate whatsoever, right? Is it worthless? Absolutely not. Everything has a place. Is it better than direct measurement? Not very frequently. And then finally, permanent product, which kind of exists in its own little bubble, involves measuring the outcome or result of a behavior rather than observing the behavior itself. So we're not observing the behavior we're looking at physical evidence or the product after the behavior has occurred. So behavior happens, time passes, and then we're going to measure that the outcome. What is the product, right? What is the product? What did that produce? So it allows for delayed measurement. It allows for the data collector. They don't have to be present for the behavior. For example, if I'm a teacher and I give out an exam, I don't have to watch every student take the exam. I'm going to grade that exam at the end of the day. Or the parent, they're going to know what the kid did and did not miss, even though they didn't watch them take the exam. Clean room. If you say clean your room by the end of the day, you can go and check that. Completed grocery list. Here's a list of items. Get all of these. You don't have to go to the store to check. Did they get all the items? And then property destruction, things like that. Now, with permanent product, we want to be sure that the product is consistent. It doesn't do us any good if the product only occurs once. We need that repeatable measurement, right? But permanent product, not too challenging, right? Pretty, pretty common sense. Advantages, observer doesn't need to be present, which is always nice, right? If you're limited on time, limited on resources, you don't have to be there. It's convenient. It allows for the measurement of behaviors that occur at inconvenient times or places. Maybe you're in one place and the client's in another. And it reduces observer reactivity. Nobody's watching the behavior happening but the behavior is still producing something that we can measure. 
Disadvantages, does not provide information about the behavior process. We're not going to know duration, latency, magnitude. We're not going to know ABCs because we're not there, right? We're just going to know the outcome. We can't account for who performed the behavior. Maybe ambiguous. The clean room doesn't tell you how it was cleaned. So there are a lot of flaws to permanent product, but just like indirect measurement, there's a time and a place. It's up to you as the analyst to decide when that time and place is. So here's a couple ideas for how you should do right measurement. Let's talk about direct measurement. Best for most behaviors. Most behaviors can be directly measured. If you can, you should. When accuracy and real-time data are critical, directly measure. When observer presence is feasible or you're capable of being there, do it. Examples, frequency, duration, latency, etc. Indirect measurement, best for that initial assessment, those intake interviews, surveys, those kind of things. You're just gathering information. You should do indirect assessments every time you talk to the stakeholder, every time you talk to the client. Gather more information. Behaviors that are private, maybe those, those thoughts and feelings that are private events that we can't see, but we can at least discuss. When direct observation is impossible. So interviewing parents about sleep problems, using a behavior rating scale for hyperactivity. Permanent product measures, behaviors that naturally leave a tangible outcome. So if it's reliable and we know there's always going to be a tangible product, this is fine. When observer presence is difficult, when measuring academic or work output, which obviously would leave those tangible outcomes. So completed homework assignments, number of assembled toys, food waste. All right, that's C2, direct, indirect, and product measures. Pretty straightforward, not a overly challenging topic. As always, be sure to subscribe for all of our updates. We're going to continue on our six edition task list as usual, along with new practice exams, new practice questions. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our famous combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.